Amashia Lion of Judah Father Lord we worship your name we honor you God we give you all the praise thank you for life Thank you for your mercy. Lord, we commit this service into your hands. Holy Spirit, we ask that you teach us. Let our hearts indict new things. And let those new things be good things. And let your name be glorified. Thank you, God of heaven. In Jesus' mighty name. Hallelujah. Please be seated. God bless you. Good afternoon. Welcome to church. It's um, the Well Oasis International and we are in a series known as Margins. We're in the series Margins and um, this is our sixth installment of Margins. This is our sixth installment of Margins. Last week, in our fifth in installment, we talked about relational currency how the investments in our relationships number one how god is a relational god number two how he's made it his point of duty to make sure that he keeps us in relationships <clears throat> how the relationships hold keys to some level of margin in our lives and how we must break the hold and the yoke of isolation and open ourselves up to the place of relational currency and power. As we move on today quickly, we want to look at the sixth installment. We are going to be trying to make margins in our time. Hallelujah. And today's title is Do What the Occasion Demands. Do what the occasion demands. We will look at the wisdom in stewarding time properly. And in doing that, we'll try and answer the question, what is time? How does God see and use time? What are the dynamics of time? What is the advantage of time? And how do we define our time properly? If you go with me to Ecclesiastes chapter 3, beginning from verse number 1, all the way to verse 11, I'm going to read it, then I'll come back and we'll begin to do what we need to do. I'm going to read from the King James Version, because it's the version that talks about, that is the best version for this particular scripture. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse number 1, it says, To every time there is a season, and a time to every purpose under the heaven. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to pluck up that which is planted. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to break down and a time to build up. A time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn, and a time to dance, a time to cast away stones, and a time to gather stones together, a time to embrace, 
and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to get and a time to lose. A time to keep and a time to cast away. A time to rend <clears throat> and a time to sow. A time to keep silence and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time of war and a time of peace. What profit had he that walketh in that wherein he laboreth? I have seen the travail which God had given to the sons of men to be exercised in it. He had made everything beautiful in his time. Also he set, he had set eternity, he set the word in their hearts so that no man can find out the work that God maketh from the beginning to the end. If you go to the Amplified and you read verse number 11, it says, he had made everything beautiful and appropriate in its time. He has also planted eternity, a sense of divine purpose in the heart, in the human heart, a mysterious longing which nothing under the sun can satisfy except God. Yet, man cannot find out, comprehend, grasp what God has done. His overall plan from the beginning to the end. Hallelujah. If we're beginning by looking at verse number one of Ecclesiastes chapter three, it says to every time there is a season, to everything there is a season, to everything there is a time, to every purpose under heaven. So a season and a time or everything has a season and a time. And everything has a purpose. Everything has a season and a time. And everything has a purpose. Recently, I began to look at heaven's systems of advantage. Simply, I'm looking into the keys that God has made available for man's advantage. A man who is in Christ. Time is one of the most critical of those keys. Time is a heavenly system of advantage. Given to us. Especially because we are in Christ and we have the capacity to do many things with time that most people don't have. In understanding time, there is a need for me to try and take apart Verse number one of Ecclesiastes chapter three. It says there is nothing under the heaven that does not answer to time. Really, that's what it is saying. It says everything answers to time. But before time, I saw season. The question is what is the difference or correlation between, between season and time? Season and time, the same thing or are they different? If they are the same, how? If they are not, what's the difference? Because everything answers to time. To everything there is a season and a time to every purpose. God does not speak in time. God speaks in seasons. When God instructs a man, he instructs a man in seasons. He doesn't instruct by time. Time is the, if you like, if you know, let me say it, then I will explain what I mean. Time is the exclusive advantage of man. That's why the Bible says God does not dwell in time. God has no need for time. So when God speaks to man, he speaks to man from where? From it, in seasons. He instructs man in seasons and he speaks to God from it, to man from eternity. Which is why in the Amplified Version, it says God has planted eternity in the heart of man. A longing that cannot be satisfied by anything except God himself. Let me try. What this means is that eternity is where God resides and is where God speaks out of. Seasons is how man works out his eternity. 
But time, like that thing that Pastor Naro was talking about, time are the short, short races within seasons. No man is able to run a season from the beginning to the end if he does not have timelines and time frames. So time is an advantage, divine advantage that has been given to the sons of men that they might thrive on their journey to eternity. But you see, time is very, 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 very slippery. Time can easily, and I mean easily, be wasted. Time can easily, and I mean easily, be lost. There is so much about time that I wonder sometimes, even this morning I wondered, why would God give so much power, pack so much power in time, and then once it's gone, it's gone. So everything has a purpose and every purpose has a season and a time. What is purpose there for? For PU students and alumni, here's another definition of purpose. Purpose is the delight of God. Purpose is the delight of God. So purpose is how you live and God would be happy. Purpose is how you live and how and God will take delight in you. Purpose is how we live and God will look down from heaven and then that thing that happens that um, Revelation chapter 4 talks about happens. He looks at you and he's just pleasured just by taking a look at how you do. Which tells me that purpose is extremely important, yes? And so I can understand that we have a whole purpose university. Yet, purpose is useless if time is not mastered. As lofty and important as purpose is, unless you master time, purpose is a waste of time because you can't even get it done. So why are we so focused on purpose and no one is talking about time? It's not because we are not talking about time. It's just that in how many ways do you want to talk about time? Tell me in how many ways do you want to talk about time? Remember that margins is a series on wisdom. So I actually try to score the book of Proverbs. Proverbs doesn't use the word time many times. Therefore, the mistake we tend to make is to think that season and time are one are the same. But they are not. A season captures the faces and the cycles of a man's life within his purpose. I'll take that again and I'll take it slow. A season captures the faces and the cycles of a man's life within his journey of purposeful living. An understanding of seasons therefore positions you to comprehend and define your place in purpose. An understanding of seasons positions you to comprehend and define accurately your place in purpose as you align with your face of the circle. Because as you are on this journey, Unless you can tell what your season is, you may act out of time. That's why the Bible says all things are lawful, but not all things are expedient. What that means is that some things in their lifespan, they were doable at some point, but right now they've expired. What this means is that how you treat your season determines on how you deliver on purpose. How you treat your seasons determines how you deliver on purpose. That's why when you go to the book of Joel, it talks about young men seeing visions and uh, dreaming dreams, and it talks about old men seeing visions. Am I correct? 
you will notice that why dreams and visions almost sound alike when we're just speaking everyday English, they're not the same. The season of your life determines what you are able to produce. But your season is broken into time. So even in, in the natural, we have four seasons if we're going by Oimbo seasons and we have two if we're just doing Nigeria and Africa. We have raining season, we have dry season. It's very easy. But even within rainy season, there are months, there are weeks, there are times, there are minutes, there are hours, there are minutes, there are seconds, yes? So therefore, in the rainy season, for instance, there is a time we call, um, we, we call something August break, yes? It's still within the rainy season, but there is a seizure of the rains for some time. And then there is one, we don't have a name for it, so we call it seven day rain. That every single day it is raining. And how we know that our streets are flooded. So therefore, for instance, when God said do the rot conference in July, people actually called me and told me it was a bad idea. They said it's a raining season. Nobody should be organizing a conference in July. So my job was to discern, is this God or is this me? This was God. So God is the owner of the rain. So he will find a way to sort out the rain. Because if you go by logic, it does not make sense in the third weekend of July to put a major conference. People don't even plan their weddings at those times. But there was something beyond the natural that I knew that made me say, we'll forge ahead and we'll just stick with what God has said. Hallelujah. So seasons are phases or cycles of a man's life within purpose. And an understanding of your seasons will position you to comprehend and define your place in purpose so you can align. What this means is how you treat your season determines how you deliver on your purpose. What is time there for, Sister B? Time is the element that determines that you do your seasons well. Time is the element that determines that you do your seasons well so that you delight God. I'll take it one more time. Time is the element that determines that you do your seasons well to deliver on how you delight God. You cannot therefore fulfill a life where you delight God until you have the wisdom that gives you dominion and mastery over time. You cannot therefore fulfill a life where you delight God until you have the wisdom that gives you dominion and mastery over time. If we go to Genesis chapter 1, I know I can hear someone say she's going there again. Seriously? In verse 28, you are given a five-fold mandate. One of those, of that five-fold mandate is the mandate of dominion, the mandate of rulership. Unless you have mastery over time, you cannot fulfill the mandate of dominion. So what is time? Because I still haven't defined it, yes? Time, therefore, is captured in occasions, in moments, and happenings within a season. I'll say it one more time. Time is captured in occasions, moments, and happenings within a season. Time is beyond where the long hand or the long dial of the clock and the short dial of the clock is. Yes, that's a time within time. But when we're talking about this thing that gives us mastery, we're talking about the things that happen within a season. So remember, a season is a phase. That phase can be seven months, 
It can be seven years. It can be three years. Whatever. That's a season. But within that season, there are things that determine whether it's a time to die or a time to live. Whether it's a time to be given a marriage or a time to refrain from marrying. If you look at Ecclesiastes, everything about time is determined by something that has happened. Did I throw you off? Do I need to go over that again? I said that time is captured in moments, is captured in occasions, and in, is captured in happenings within a season. Let me explain something before I go back to Ecclesiastes chapter 3. So therefore, in this room right now, look at the many of us that are here. We're doing the same exact thing, yes? We're listening to a message on the same day, at the same time, yes? Yet, how many of us know that our seasons are different? Yet, we're in this room in this time and we're doing the same thing. Your definition or your comprehension of what is happening right now, in relation to what your season is, will determine whether this is useful for you or not. So there are people that this word is a file away word. Because they haven't got to the place where time is the thing they need to master. And then there are others who, for whom this is fresh air. In fact, if they don't get this now, they will choke to death. Do you understand that now? And I said that when you read Ecclesiastes chapter 3, everything that I said about time is highlighted by an occurrence. Everything that is said about time is highlighted by an occurrence. A time to be born. A time to die. How many of us recognize that in the same exact minute, one person can be born and one person can die? So what, how do you define, and I mean in the same family. I'm not talking of neighbors. I'm not talking of people in separate cities. Have we not seen when a mother is just gives up the ghost as her baby cries for the first time. Somebody said, go for me, go for me, go for me. I didn't say it was going to happen to you. Praise Jesus. So time is captured by moments, occasions, and happenings. So let's go back to that example you don't like of a man whose wife dies as his baby is born. Unless God gives him capacity to understand that moment, that time, he would never be able to exercise dominion over it. That time that is the time of the greatest joy in his life can also be the time that breaks him. Unless God teaches him how to, how to comprehend that time within that season of his life. Is this confusing? Because if it's confusing, I'm making, I'm, ma I'm making progress. How many people are confused? The more people are confused, the more progress I'm making. A correct analysis of time, therefore, is in decoding what the moments, the occasions, and the happenings mean within a season. A correct analysis which leads to a mastery of time is determined by a decoding of what the moments, the occasions, and the happenings within a season mean. A season by implication, if you're paying attention, is bigger than time. But a season would be hollow without the occurrences of time within it. I said a season by the definitions we have looked at is greater than time, yes? Eh? But a season will be hollow. That is, it will just be one poof thing with no center. But, uh, or without the occurrences of time within it. So what are, in nature, for instance, what are the most profound 
telling of time in nature. The sun and the moon. Night and day. Isn't it? Do you know that right now we have daylight, yes? So it's day for us. Do you know that if you swore that this is day, right now, how many of us know you are, some of us will be wrong, that you can't swear and say, lie, lie, in the scheme of God, this is day right now. Because there's a nation somewhere that is in thick darkness right now, it's night. Do you see it? Just the same way I can be standing here right now looking at the time and because it's broad daylight, I say this is day. Do you know that someone else, based on the occurrence or the happening or the moment in their life, this can be the darkest moment of their life. Therefore, it's night. So time is beyond this thing. That's why man is the only one that needs a clock. God does not need a clock. So the biggest challenge for man is what time am I on? This time or the one that has no defined way of recognizing except by what has happened or what is about to happen. The key to doing it well in life is to become the delight of God. We all know that, yes? That is to say that you align with some assignment that dovetails with God's purpose for your life and you get it done. To become this delight, we must clearly define our seasons. We know up to that point, yes? Yet this definition alone is not indicative of a pro properly stewarded season. Just because I know that it is spring in my head for my life does not translate to mean that I have stewarded spring well. It's just a definition. I only just know. What I allow to happen to me and what I do within that season determines whether I have mastered, mastered or I have dominion over time in it. So therefore, moment management is the key to time management. I'll say it again. Moment management is the key to time management. What is moment management? To know what to do and to do it. This is moment by moment. Go with me to 1 Samuel chapter 10 because I'll probably be able to show you something there that you may have seen before or you may not have seen before. In 1 Samuel chapter 10, that's just the account of when Saul's father's donkeys went missing and Saul went looking for the donkeys. Hallelujah. And then after a while, he couldn't find the donkey, so he was going to go back. His servant said to him, let's go. There is a man of God in the city not far from here, or a town not far from here. And he knows what has happened, and he can tell us. Which is why they found Samuel. Now, if you remember, when they got to Samuel, the first thing Samuel did was he put them at the table because Samuel already, by God, God had already told Samuel that Saul was coming. And when Saul shows up, one of the things he's going to do to Saul was anoint him as king. You remember? So Saul shows up. Samuel already has all the plans laid out. There was a huge table that had been laden with food because the king is coming. And the moment Saul came with his servant, they moved Saul in and they put Saul at the head of the table. Saul was so shaken by that honor that was accorded him that he was wondering what exactly is happening here. At the end of that, Saul took, Samuel took him. That's where uh, chapter 10 of 1 Samuel starts off. Verse number 1 says, Then Samuel took the flask of oil and poured it on Saul's head, kissed him and said, has the Lord not anointed you as ruler over his inheritance, Israel? What did Saul come here to look for? What was Saul looking for? He was looking for donkeys. So when Saul left home, what was the season of his life? He was an ordinary man in search of his father's donkey. 
The moment he stepped into Samuel's house, Saul's season changed. Saul did not even know. I need you to pay attention to me. That's why I said that the key to stewarding time and knowing your seasons well and doing them well is by what happens. So by the time, effectively, when Saul walked into Samuel's house, Saul was already de facto king in heaven. God had made up his mind, this is the first king of Israel. Yet they took the king and they sat him at the head of the table and the king was like, what's happening here? May you be aware <laughs> in the name of Jesus. But that is not the exciting part for me in 1 Samuel chapter 10. The exciting part for me in 1 Samuel chapter 10 is that after he anointed him, he now started. You know, when I picture the scripture, I picture Samuel talking to Saul like IJ would talk to Amarachi, a little child. He said to him, when you leave me today, you will meet two men beside Rachel's tomb. In the territory of Benjamin and Zaza, they will say to you, the donkeys you went to look for have been found. And your father has stopped caring about them and is worried about you saying, what shall I do about my son? Then you will go further from there. <laughs> And you will come to the terrible tree of Tabor. And three men going up to sacrifice to God at Bethel will meet you there. One carrying three goats. Another three loaves of bread. And another carrying a jug of wine. They will greet you and give you two loaves of bread. Which you will accept from their hand. After that you will come to the hill of God. Where the garrison of the Philistines is. And when you come there to the city, you will meet a group of prophets coming down from the high place of worship with a harp, tambourine, flute, and lair before them. And they will be prophesying. Then the Spirit of God will come upon you mightily. And you will prophesy with them. And you will be changed to another man. Verse 7 is the key. When these signs come to you, do what do for yourself whatever the situation requires, for God is with you. In the New King James Version, it says, When these signs happen, do for yourself what the occasion. Let's go back. What is Samuel looking for again? Between when Samuel left his house and when he eventually started to go up to Saul, something had shifted. Uh, um, Saul, rather. Something has shifted about Saul that Saul was not aware of. He was in one season. He was a son of Kish looking for Kish's donkeys. But something had shifted in the heavens which meant that his season had changed. But nothing showed him that something had changed. In that time, God had prepared the man of God. Saul's season has changed. There will be a list of things that will happen to convince Saul that his season has changed. Kazin dalima hantale prakusin delibatush. Father Lord, open their minds this afternoon. Let not one leave this place without comprehending what you are saying. It was the only reason why Samuel started to tell him one by one. It's like, Amarachi, stand up. When you stand up, lace, off, lace your shoes. Can you see the, uh, and then when you turn, when you get to the kitchen, you will see uh, Auntie Njideka. Do you remember Auntie Njideka? Yes. When you get there, tell her to give you water to bring for me. Okay, mommy. And when you get there, tell her to use the orange cup. Amarachi, do you know the orange cup? Yes. So, grown man, 
What's all this? Step by step. Because the only way that Saul would master the time that he was in is to know that every single thing that is happening within that time is heaven ordained. Here's the thing. And if after this you tell me to shut up, it will be fine. The problem with mastering time for us is that we are too focused on what we have no control over. You will get it maybe in 21 years. Someone was saying to Saul, you have no control over what's going to happen between now and when you get home and they make you king effectively. But the one who has ordained the things that will happen, we, have, we do this and do that and do that. But when you read on in the book of 1 Samuel, do you recognize that nobody, to, after a while, nobody told Samuel these things again, Saul these things again. Which is the only reason why in the time when he should not take anything hostage or captive, he took Agag. Because Agag sounded like proof that he was a king. I said your time and your capacity to master time is captured in the things that happen within the time. So he told him, do this one, do that one. That will happen and that will happen. That will happen, and that will happen. And then when all this have happened, then the Spirit of God will come upon you. And then after that, hey, after that, you will be changed to another man. And then do what the occasion requires. Tell your neighbor, do what the occasion requires. In 1 Chronicles chapter 12, verse 32, talks about the sons of Ishaka. It says in the NLT, they understood the times. And the, or they understood the signs of the times and knew what Israel should do. You see, 1 Chronicles 12, 32, the sons of Ishaka, they understood the, time, the signs of the times. And knew what Israel should do. I need you to pay attention to the language of that scripture. It's not that they understood time. They understood the signs. What are signs? The manifestations. The occasions within time. They had an understanding of that. And if you read further down, because of that, the people of Israel knew what to do. <laughs> if we consider the scripture in the light of wisdom for time, grace towards of time know what to do. They 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 know what to do. Now, if the spirit of God is upon you, pay attention to me, and you are a changed man, you ought to know what to do. <laughs> but like I said, our definitions are almost always wrong. So you find someone losing sleep. You find someone going crazy over what is not in their control to do. Do you remember that the first thing that Samuel said to Saul was that you will meet some people and the first thing they will tell you is that the donkeys you went to look for, they have been found. So effectively, that was beyond your control. You thought you were looking for donkeys. Heaven sent you to be anointed. Sheila had a dabadunko soto yima handalege.
He said, they've been found. But what do I do? What I can't control is what I lose sleep over. The problem with that is that as long as I'm losing sleep over what is not my forte, what is not in the tray of the something for BMM to do tray, I'm just wasting time. May you not waste time in Jesus' name. Amen. To know what to do, therefore, ought to be easy. Except that for many, that is the exact problem. They don't know what to do. And the reason they don't know what to do, and I'm about to set you free right now, is that you don't know what to do because what you are doing your best to know what to do is above your pay grade. You have no clearance to do it. If you recognize this, you will utilize your time well. If you recognize this, you will sleep when everybody's doing acrobatics. Because the moment you wake up, you've checked it. Uh, this one is beyond my pay grade. You go back to sleep. They'll be screaming. They'll be like, you are sleeping. You'll say, what do you want me to? I don't even know whether my husband knew this as a spiritual principle. But since I know Macmordi, he's very clear about what is about above his pay grade. I will be like, we can't sleep. And then wake up. And he'll be like, BMM, the thing you are forcing over is happening in Lankwese. If we don't sleep this night, what can we do? But that never helped me. He will turn around and in two seconds he's snoring. Then I'm elbowing because I mean there is something that someone else, it's above your pay grade is what he was telling me. And as long as you continue to struggle within time to do what is above your pay grade, you will never do that which is ab within your pay grade. It's beyond our control. An understanding of the times can only be proven by knowing what to do. And in knowing what to do, what is beyond your control does not count. Should I take it again? I said an understanding of time can only be proven by knowing what to do. That is, you master time by knowing what to do. Anyone who finds himself in a moment in time and is confused has not mastered time, does not have dominion over time. Do you understand it this far? Now, to be able to master time, what is beyond your control does not count. What that means is God will not hold you to what he did not give you the capacity to deal with. Is that easier for you to comprehend? Psalm number 90, verse number 12. Teach us to number our days that we may cultivate and bring you a heart of wisdom. That's the amplified version cultivate and bring you a heart of wisdom. That is how, in your teaching us to number our days, that we will be able to cultivate and bring you a heart of wisdom. In the Passion Translation, it says, help us to remember that our days are numbered and help us to interpret our lives correctly. <laughs> Set your wisdom deeply in our hearts so that we may accept your correction. The King James says, teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. Back to 1 Samuel chapter 10 verse 1 to 7. The prophet Samuel from the point that Saul showed up before him did a number of things. Number one, he anointed him, kissed him, and announced his new season to him. Why Saul was still confused, he said, you are now king. The second thing he did, he said to him, when you live today, that's your verse number two, you will see this. Then when verse number two has manifested, he said to him ahead, when you go further, you will come to. Then he said, they will greet you and they will give you. After that, you will. Then 
the spirit of God. There are things you must do for the spirit of God to alight on you, to give you the dominion to do what the occasion requires going forward. Then the spirit of the Lord will come. You will become a changed man. Then you will prophesy. When these signs come to you, do for yourself whatever the situation requires. For God is with you. Do as the occasion demands. For God is with you. How do you create margins in your time, therefore? Number one, clearly define time by paying attention to your moments, to your occasions, and to your happenings. I think that the best and the most potent counsel I can give you when we talk about time is that you learn how to walk your seasons. Anytime you try to do what you are not, your season is not configured to deliver within time, you will break something. Which is why if your children are young, for instance, there is only so much responsibility you can put on top of that one. Otherwise, you will break things fundamentally. Clearly define time by doing what? Not by looking at the hands of the clock. By paying attention to the moments, the occasions, and the things that are happening within that season. So you can already tell when it's a time to mourn. Because what would have preceded it is someone died or something was lost. It's very clear. Somebody would not need to tap you at that point to say it's time to cry. You already know. <laughs> and you know a time to rejoice. Because something would have landed. You do not need an announcement on the radio that it is time to rejoice. Your body just goes in the mode of rejoicing. Why? Because something has happened that has signaled to you what, the time, it, what time it is. No, clearly defined by paying attention to moments, occasions, and happenings. Number two, know what is beyond your control. I can't say this enough. Know what is beyond your control. Number three, be clear how one day, that is a time frame, flows or feeds into another. Let's go back to Saul again. Saul left his house. What was he looking for? His father's donkeys. He had looked for three days, I believe, and he could not find them. And then Saul's decision was to go back home. But his servant said to him, let's go and look for the man of God that lives in a town not far from here. That was a dynamic that shifted things for Saul. It would take something. For lack of a better word, I will use the word discernment, which is the brother of wisdom. So know that the servant can suggest something and you will just go. So even said, he said, but I don't have anything to give him. Do you remember? Be clear what is beyond your control. Number three, be clear how one day or time frame feeds into another. So Samuel or Saul had moved into another season just by paying attention to what his servant had said and making that decision to turn. Hallelujah. Then the next thing that I see is obey or do what you know to do. Obey or do what you know to do. Because even when he got there, he wanted to start to, start to speak in front of everybody. Someone said, no, come in. So they walked in. And then after they had eaten, I, if, I'm, if my memory is serving me right, Samuel asked some people to excuse them. If you are unconscious to what is happening around you, you will never master time. The thing about what is happening around us is there are no sirens to announce what is happening around us. It 
Ephesians chapter 5 verse number 16. Ephesians chapter 5 verse number 16. Ephesians 5 verse 16. Making the most, let me begin from verse 15. Therefore, see that you walk carefully. I'm reading the Amplified. Living life with honor, purpose, and courage. Shunning those who tolerate and enable evil. Not as the unwise, but as wise, sensible, intelligent, discerning people. Verse 16, making the very most of your time on earth. Recognizing, pay attention to me, and taking advantage of every opportunity and using it with wisdom and diligence because the days are filled with evil. Therefore, verse 17, do not be foolish and thoughtless, but understand and firmly grasp what the will of God is. How do I know what's happening in the moment? You have three resources. Resource number one is the word of God. Resource number two is the Holy Spirit. Resource number three is the will of God. Do you want me to go again? Resource number one for decoding the things that are happening within time so that you can gain mastery over time, the word of God. Resource number two, Holy Spirit. Resource number three, the will of God. Why isn't the word of God the will of God? The word of God is the will of God. But there are some moments and some happenings and some occasions that you can actually physically uh, open the word of God or hear the word of God being said to you. Hallelujah. Other times you would not have that, um, that pleasure or that comfort or that advantage. You will have to discern the will of God. Do what the occasion requires or demands, yes. Do what the occasion demands. Do what the occasion demands. What that means, Dashulai, is that as long as you know what the occasion demands now, that's all that is required of you. Do it. Because before the next thing, you will know what that requires. Every time you don't sleep, it's never about the day you have lived. Is it not always about the day you are about to live? That you do not even know whether Jesus will come before that day breaks. But that's how we lose hair. That's how we gray fast. That's how we have wrinkles and bags under our eyes. That's how. We are too concerned about what is above our pay grade. What is in the now? Can you even see what God is doing right now? That's why when people ask me, Stabi, how, where do you see yourself in 10 years? How? 10 years, long, long. I don't even know where I will be tomorrow. I'm very hopeful. And almost convinced that I will still be in my house in Lekki here. But that's about it. I have no clue what, I, what will happen tomorrow. I have some meetings lined up. I still have no clue. What this means, therefore, is the greatest steward of time or stewarding of time is in the capacity to be awake and conscious. The greatest steward or stewarding of time 
is the, is in the capacity to be awake and conscious. That means that you are in tune with God and what he's doing in the earth. And your, that earth is your piece of the earth in that time that you find yourself. As long as you can be aware of what is happening and what God is doing, in the moment, you would always master time. Because the moment that requires urgency, you will feel it on the inside of you. And then the moment that is a suggestion, you will know as well. Unless, perhaps... You sent the Holy Spirit to your village to go and check what the witches are doing and he's not with you. If it's possible. Because if he's with you and your channels are not clogged, that is how we master time. That's why when you look at Ecclesi uh, Ephesians chapter 5, it talks about redeeming time. Redeeming time. What does it mean to redeem time? To buy back time. And I was thinking about it. I'm like, what on earth are you talking about? If I can only master time by the things that are happening in the moment, how on earth do I redeem time? And God said to me, that is a divine advantage. It's not that I will bring it to you. I will take you through a process called restoration so that you can buy back what was taken. But today is not about that. Today is just let me master the time. Let me be awake and aware. And so I thought about it for a bit. I, I, I'm thinking, okay, Lord, how do I know this? How do I ensure that I never fall foul of this? What exactly am I supposed to do? Then I remembered what God told us from the beginning. Rely on wisdom. Rely on the spirit of God. Rely on wisdom. Rely on the spirit of God. Rely on wisdom. Rely on the spirit of God. That is how we master time. That is how we have dominion over time. And as long as you have dominion over time, it says that when eternity shows, shows up it will pull you and time will not be able to hold you back because what he was saying in Ecclesiastes chapter 3 verse 1 to 11 a time to die can be the reasons when eternity shows up and a man will not move but when you understand and you can define things properly then even when it's just been a time that you've lost something and eternity begins to tug at you you do not sit at a place where you lose something you get up you have a shower you anoint your head and you move and you step into eternity. I can't tell you how many of God's children are stuck where they lost something because they did not read the next time. I want us to pray. I said time is a divine advantage. <laughs> If time is a divine advantage, shouldn't you ask for the capacity to discern time? Because otherwise, how do you get to harness what is within the moment for you? How do you get to do that? Pray and speak to God. If you are one who is not friendly with the Holy Spirit, this is a good place to say, Holy Spirit, I beg to apply to be your friend. Because otherwise I don't know. But Lord, if my seasons are captured in time, and time is captured in happenings, occasions, and moments, in the name of Jesus, may I always read my moments right. May I know to do what the occasion requires. May I not find myself in a place where I can't see what you are doing. Because the moment you are in a place and you can't see what God is doing in that moment, then you would loan yourself to different things that may not be relevant for your journey in that time. 
Speak to God. This is your own prayer. I can't pray for you. This is your own prayer. I can't pray it for you. This is your own prayer. I can't pray it for you. This is your own prayer. I can't pray for you. But I can give you a hint. How about you ask Holy Spirit to help you pray? Because apparently, for some of us, the prayer is above or beyond our control. Kasindali mahatu labrahata keshedebo. Zindeli makusakatu labrahasandali mahita yi. Kete patu sondo lupe teta yu mahantali kati lagada. Zede de bago sutoluma kazege de batu shuntolu katali galage. Brizendeli kasuga de bahandali makoso koto yu drahandali bahute. Zebra kashendeli gadi patu sandili mahantali gadi braha tu soto yu bedi. Zigli bahanda libra hazu godo bahanta lima hanti li Bazunde lege de 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 bagaziga liga duto shuta lima teke te yeke te libra Zomba limi kisiga liga da batu sondo luma kasege de As the rest of us are praying if you are in here or you are online And you have never given your life to Jesus This is the time that you begin to pray And say Lord Jesus I give you my life this conversation about time is serious. I do not want to miss what my time holds for me. Lord Jesus, I give you my life. I want to steward my time well. Lord, I want to create margins in my life by doing right by my time. Zombe Zupata shilemega zikata liga da dede de bakasundali makato roba. Zumpreke sekete liga du da bahanda li meke segede badu shata. Father Lord, we worship you. Father Lord, we thank you. We honor you, O oh God, because many things are beyond us, but nothing is beyond you. Lord, we are grateful that you would pull the curtain for us to see what is required. Lord, in the name of Jesus, as we put our hands in your hand and partner with the Spirit, so that we might be able to be great stewards of the time you have given us. Father, Lord, in the name of Jesus, may we receive divine advantage. In the name of Jesus. May the systems work for us because they are divinely orchestrated. In the name of Jesus. Lord, just like Saul stepped in, Father, help us to step in. But Lord, let us not misread like Saul read. Let's not misread like Saul misread in the latter days of his life. In the name of Jesus. Father, we give you all the praise. We give you all the glory. Thank you, God of heaven. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen and amen.